Well, Jesus has took us through this so far. And he's going to take us the rest of the way if we let him. So praise him for what he's doing. Praise him what he's going to do. So we ask that in Jesus' name. Right. Revelations 22, 12 through 13. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all my people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So be it. Say all that again. <laughs> now, <here you> are. <laughs> now I'm on. Oh wow. We heard that. Oh good. Good. I got a big big mouth, so anyway, let me see here. Um, Revelation is above all a book of hope. It shows that no matter what happens on earth, God is in control. It promises that evil will not last forever. And it depicts the wonderful reward that is waiting for all of those who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I got a lot of this, or all my information came out of my little study Bible, and it's, um, it's just different um, explanations. And this one is just a, kind of a review of Revelations altogether. And it starts out with, 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 thy, with tiny wrinkles and cries, he entered the world and wrapped, and wrapped in strips of cloth took his first nap on a bed of straw. Subject to time and to parents, he grew to manhood in a Roman-occupied Palestine, his gentle hands becoming strong and calloused in Joseph's woodworking shop. As a man, he walked through the countryside and city, touching individuals, preaching to crowds, and training 12 men to carry on his work. At every step, he was hounded by those seeking to rid the world of his influence. Finally, falsely accused and tried, he was condemned to a grace, disgraceful execution by foreign hands, and he died, spat upon, cursed, pierced by nails, and hung heavenward to all to decide Jesus, the God-man, gave his light completely so that we all might live. God's, at God's appointed time, the risen and ascended Lord Jesus will burst onto the world scene then everyone will know that Jesus is Lord of the universe. Those who love him will, will rejoice, greeting their Savior with hearts overflowing into songs of praise. But his enemies will be filled with fear. Allied with Satan, the enemies of Christ will marshal their legends against Christ and his enemies, armies, I'm sorry. But who can withstand God's wrath? Christ will win the battle and reign victorious forever. Jesus, the humble serving servant, suffering servant, is also the powerful, conquering king and judge. Revelation is a book of hope. 
John, the beloved apostle and eyewitness of Jesus, proclaimed that the victorious Lord would surely return to vindicate the righteous and judge the wicked. But Revelation is also a book of warning. Things were not as they should have been in this churches, so Christ called the members to commit themselves to live in righteousness. Although Jesus gave this revelation of himself to John nearly 2,000 years ago, it still stands as a comfort and a challenge to God's people today. We can take heart as we understand John's version of hope. Christ will return to rescue his people and settle accounts with all who defy him. John begins this book by explaining how he receives this revelation from God. He then records specific messages from Jesus to the seven churches in Asia. Suddenly, the scene shifts as a mosaic of dramatic and majestic images burst into view before John's eyes. This series of visions portrays the future rise of evil, culminating in the Antichrist. Then follows John's recurring of the triumph of the king over all kings, the wedding of the lamb, the final judgment, and the coming of the new Jerusalem. Revelation concludes with the promise of Christ's soon return. John breathes a prayer that has been echoed by Christians through the century. Amen, come Lord Jesus. As you read the book of Revelation, marvel with John at the wondrous panorama of God's revealed plan. Listen as Christ warns the churches and root out any sin that blocks your relationship with him. Be full of hope, knowing that God is in control. Christ's victory is assured, and all who trust in him will be saved. Then they have another little, um, uh, they call it the blueprint, and it's on Revelation, of course. The vision John receives opens with instructions for him to write to the seven churches. He both commends them for their strength and warns them about their flaws. Each letter was directed to a church then in existence, but also speaks to individual lives. We must certainly fight against the temptation to become loveless, immoral, lenient, compromising, lifeless, or casual about our faith. The letters make it clear how our Lord feels about these qualities. Then they have a little section here, it's called mega themes. And this is the mega themes that they say is in um, Revelation. God is sovereign. He is greater than any power in the universe. God is not to be compared with any leader, government, or religion. He controls history for the purpose of uniting the true believers in loving fellowship. And what's the importance of that? Through Satan's power, though Satan's power may temporarily be, wait a minute, though Satan's power may temporarily increase, we are not to be led astray. God is all powerful. He is in control. He will bring us true family safety into him with our very life. Christ came to earth as a lamb, the symbol of his perfect sacrifice for our sin. He will return as, as the triumph lion, the rightful ruler and conqueror. He will defeat Satan, settle accounts with all those who reject him, and bring his faithful people to eternity. And the importance of that is that the assurance of Christ's return gives suffering Christians the strength to endure. We can look forward to his return as king and judge. Since no one knows the time when he will appear, we must be ready at all times by keeping our faith strong. John wrote to encourage the church to resist the demands to worship the Russian empire, emperor. He warns of God's faithful people to be devoted only to Christ. Revelation identifies who the faithful people are and what they should be doing until Christ returns. And the importance of that is that you can take your place in the ranks of God's faithful people by believing in Christ. Victory is sure for those who resist temptation and make loyalty to Christ new, their top, top priority. One day God's anger towards sin will be fully and completely unleashed. Satan will be defeated with all of his agents. False religion will be destroyed. God will reward the faithful with eternal life but all who refuse to believe in him will face eternal punishment. And the importance of that is that evil and injustice, injustice will not prevail forever. God's final judgment will put an end to these. We need to be certain of our commitment to Jesus. If we want to escape this great and final judgment, no one who rejects Christ will escape God's punishment. 
One day God will create a new heaven and a new earth. All believers will live with him forever in perfect peace and security. Those who have already died will be raised to life. These promises for the future bring us hope. And the importance of that would be that our great hope is that what Christ promises will come true. When we have confidence in our destination, we can follow Christ with unwavering dedication. No matter what we must face, we can be encouraged by hoping in Christ's return. A long time ago, not a long time ago, but before I was really at this church and into the Bible as I am now, um, I was afraid of revelations. Um, and I, I'm sure a lot of people are. There's a lot of frightful things in there. Um, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's, it's, it, it can be quite frightening to somebody that doesn't know the background and how it's going on. But now that I'm into the Bible a little bit more than I was before, um, well, a lot more than I was before, um, it's interesting. It's still hard to believe some of the things that are in there, but it's still interesting and believing, believable, and the hope that it um, extends comes from throughout the whole Bible. Um, we are preached to over and over and over again by the Lord is to do the things that he asks, to do, asks us to do, follow his laws. And if we do that, we will receive everlasting life. And what in the world could ever be better than that? Um, the streets of gold and the happiness and everything we're going to have when we get there. But anyway, that's just a little input of mine from how I felt about revelations in the beginning. Okay, now I have another little, little story here to tell you. It's called A Journey Through the Book of Revelations. It's kind of sort of like the last one, but not, not the same thing exactly. Revelation is a complex book. It has baffled interpreters for centuries. We can avoid a great deal of confusion by understanding the literary structure of this book. This approach will allow us to understand the individual scenes within the overall structure of Revelation and keep us from getting unnecessarily bogged down in the details of each vision, which is really easy to do because they are pretty complex. John gives hints throughout the book to indicate a change of subject or a flashback to an earlier scene. First, John relates the circumstances that led to the writing of this book. Next, Jesus gives special messages to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Suddenly, John is caught up to heaven, where he sees a vision of God Almighty on the throne. All of Christ's followers and the heavenly angels are worshiping God. John watches as God's, God gives a scroll with seven seal, seals to the worthy Lamb, Jesus Christ. The Lamb begins to open the seals one by one. As each seal is opened, a new vision appears. As the first four seals are opened, riders appear on horses of different colors, war, famine, disease, and death. As the fifth seal is opened, John sees those in heaven who have been martyred for their faith in Christ. A set of contrasting images appears at the opening of the sixth seal. On one side, there is a great earthquake. Stars fall from the sky, and the sky rolls up like a scroll. On the other side, multitudes are before the throne, worshiping and praising God and the Lamb. Then the seventh seal is opened, unveiling a series of God's triumphs announced by seven angels with seven trumpets. The first four angels bring hail, fire, a mountain of fire, and a falling star. The sun and moon are darkened. The fifth trumpet announces the coming of locusts with the power to sting. The sixth trumpet heralds the coming of an ar army of warriors of horses. John is given a small scroll to eat. John is commanded to make, and I might add to that, they told him to eat the scroll. It was going to be sweet to taste, but then when it got to his stomach, it was going to make his tummy sour. And that doesn't say that here, so I thought I'd add that. <laughs> I do read some things. <laughs> John is given a small scroll to eat. Following this, John is commanded to measure the temple of God. He sees two witnesses who proclaim God's judgment on the earth for three and a half years. Finally, the seventh trumpet sounds, calling the rival forces of good and evil to the final battle. On one side is Satan and his forces. On the other side stands Jesus Christ and his forces. In the midst of this call to battle, John sees three angels announcing the final judgment. Two angels begin to reap this harvest of judgment on the earth. Following on the heels of those two angels are seven more angels who pour out God's judgment on the earth from seven bowls. 
one of these angels from a group of seven reveals to John a vision of a great prostitute called Babylon, riding a scarlet beast. After the defeat of Babylon, a great multitude in heaven shouts praise to God for his mighty victory. The final three chapters of the book of Revelation catalog the events that finalize Christ's victory over the enemy. Satan's 1,000 year imprisonment, the final judgment, and the creation of a new earth and a new Jerusalem. An angel then gives John final instructions concerning the visions. John has seen what to do once he has written them all down. John has seen what to, and the visions John has seen and what to do once he has written them all down. Revelation concludes with the promise of Christ's soon return and offer to drink of the water that flows through the great street of the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem and a warning to those who read the book. May we pray with John, Amen, come Lord Jesus. The Bible ends with a message of warning and hope of men, for men and women of every generation. Christ is victorious and all the evil has been done away with. As you read the book of Revelation, marvel at God's grace in the salvation of the saints and his power over all, all evil forces of Satan and remember the hope of his victory to come. And it just reiterates, you know, all, like I said earlier, it, uh, it's just what we've been taught through the whole Bible, and it's just a culmination of that whole, whole thing, and added with a few v visions that are kind of difficult to believe. But anyway, I have another little thing here. It's called Satan's work in this world. First thing was his hatred for Christ, then his hatred for God's people, his power and authority, his popularity among unbelievers, his blasphemy against God, his war against believers, and his ability to deceive. Just some of the little things that Satan is, has been capable of all, all these years, which will come to an end soon. And then there is another little thing called blessings and revelations. All these little things, I just found them in my book and I thought, well, this is just works out good. Seeing how I can't remember much, so I have to read everything. <laughs> okay, some seven times in Revelation, God promises blessings upon the believers. B God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, amen, and the blesses all who listen to the message and obey what it says, another amen. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lambs. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection, for then the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book, and blessed are those who wash their robes they will be permitted to enter through the gates of, city, of the city and eat their fruit from the tree of life. How can a person keep away from, evil, from the evil system? People must always be more important than products. In other words, um, the pe yeah, what was I thinking about with that? I can't remember now. But anyway, people are more important than products. In other words, People are more important than things. Alan preaches about that all the time. It's the things that are just like money and boats and all that stuff. Those are just things. But the people that you love are the important part. Keep away from pride in your own programs, plans, and successes. And that's kind of a hard thing to do sometimes. I know sometimes I find myself being a little boastful when I'm going to speak or something, and then I get scared, and then I get boastful again, and and then here I am all, all over again. <laughs> Remember that God's will and word must never be compromised. People must always be considered before the making of money, which kind of goes right back to the very first one. Do what is right, no matter what the cost. Be involved in businesses that provide worthwhile products or services, not just things that feed the world's desires. And then there was a little blurb in here about hallelujah. And I'm sure you guys have heard me say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And uh, I just love that word. I just love it. Hallelujah is an important Christian acclamation used extensively in the church's worship and 
liturgy from early times. Hallelujah is a translation into Greek and then into English of two Hebrew words that mean praise the Lord. Hallelujah does not appear anywhere in the New Testament except Revelation 19, 1 through 8. There is a chant, chant of the saints in heaven. It was taken over uh, into the church at an early date. It became the characteristic expression of joy and was therefore sung, especially at Easter, as was witnessed uh, by St. Augustine. You are continuing a long tradition from the early church by singing hallelujah to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this was very interesting, I thought. It's called The Beginning and the End. The Bible records for us the beginning of the world and the end of the world. The story of mankind from beginning to end, from the fall into sin to redemption and God's ultimate victory over evil. It is found in the pages of the Bible. In Genesis, the sun was created. In Revelation, the sun is not needed. In Genesis, the Satan is victorious. In Revelation, Satan is defeated. In Genesis, sin enters the human race. In Revelation, sin is banished. In Genesis, people run and hide from God. In Revelation, people are invited to live with God forever. In Genesis, people are cursed. In Revelation, the curse is removed. In Genesis, people are shed with sorrow for sin. No more sin in Revelation, no more tears to, or sorrow. In Genesis, the garden and earth are cursed. In Revelation, God's city is glorified, the earth is made new. In Genesis, paradise is lost. And in Revelation, paradise is regained. People are doomed to death in Genesis, and in Revelation, death is defeated. Believers live forever with God. Yeah. So let's see what else I got here. Looks like that's just about all my little, little notes I had. And we still have a lot of time, so we'll go ahead and do the video, if you would, please. And then we'll sing a song and praise the Lord some more and 